Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Guest career began in design and technology, but his curiosity about how capturing brands creates stories led to the formation of Opal. Please welcome the CEO of Opal Labs, George Huff. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I'm here with the CEO of Opal, George Huff. George, how are we doing? Doing well, doing well. Sun is shining here in Portland, Oregon, so get a little bit of free happiness. We are speaking to a local Pacific Northwest entrepreneur. They're located here in Northeast Portland, Oregon. Uh, so I'm very excited to have this conversation. But before we start talking about Opal, George, give us a little background. Who is George Huff? Well, let's see. I, uh, I grew up in Alaska, had a, had a dream of being an entrepreneur, getting into tech, sparked at a pretty young age. Um, and couldn't wait, couldn't wait to get out of there and pursue that dream uh, elsewhere. So ended up in at Oregon State University, uh, ended up in Portland, Oregon afterwards, and, and kind of started cutting my teeth from there. Uh, there's a whole lot more to that story, but uh, that, that's the sort of short version of it. Got into entrepreneurship that way. And so what did you study over at Oregon State? Uh, well, I'm, a, I'm a, an accountant's son, so I might say that I'm very practical. Uh, so I didn't, I didn't really see degrees that I wanted other than a business degree. So I decided to go that direction. It felt very practical. I could use it and apply it to anything. Um, and that's really, that's, that, that was, uh, all my, my mother's, <laughs> my mother's urging at that point, being a little bit rudderless, uh, in, in some ways, like many entrepreneurs probably are. So talk about the transition. You mentioned you went from Alaska down to Corvallis, right? And then yep. from Corvallis to Portland, Oregon. What you obviously you said you mentioned your reasoning from leaving Alaska to Corvallis. Why did you leave Corvallis to Portland? Uh, I graduated, um, and my uh, my girlfriend now wife uh, was from the Portland area, so I, I ended up here naturally. Um, but it, it's been a great spot. I mean, I got here in uh, 2004 into Portland, uh, and it, just such a cool cool time to be in Portland. If, if you know the city at all, obviously you do. Um, but to be able to be here as it was sort of emerging as this creative hub, um, and being someone that's a creative and an entrepreneur and technology driven, uh, you know, those are all really interesting things for me to, to be a part of. And, and, you know, some of the brands that are here, uh, giant footwear brand out in Beaverton, you may have heard of them, um, you know, seeing how they did business, getting really close to that was, was really inspiring. Um, so, but that's how I got to Portland. And so what was your kind of ver first venture into this entrepreneurial world? Well, <laughs> you know, if I look back, there's probably like many small false starts that you get as you are, you know, just you, you kind of have this weird thing where you like to start projects, right? And projects oftentimes turn into to businesses. And so my first, um, my first like formal LLC was actually a music label that I did out of Alaska um, called Home Skillet Records. And uh, it was all about <laughs> just finding artists and recording them. You know, this was like really pre-streaming. So it was a lot of like download our MP3s off our website kind of thing. And, you know, we, we couldn't make any much money doing that. And so we started throwing a festival to go with it. And that ended up making a little bit of money. But, you know, it, it was it was that sort of initial like, hey, why don't we just try something? Why don't we just start something? And I've taken that into a few different endeavors since then. And so tell us, where, where did the career path lead from there? Uh, well, I did that. I did that um, kind of while I had my my one in. I mean, I. I in my professional career, uh, the only job I've had was a uh, website designer and, and builder, right? And I did that for about two years. And so while I was doing that, I was doing the music thing. Um, but very shortly into that journey, I realized that I, I kind of wanted to be my own person uh, and, and go off and, and blaze my own trail. I, I had that calling I think all entrepreneurs have. Uh, and so I, I went from um, building sites that other people sold like the project to, to like actually running an agency. 
And so I did that for about five years. Um, uh, had a team of about you know, 10, 12 people, did a lot of high-end stuff, uh, product design, web design, that kind of stuff. And, uh, but like that, that wasn't, um, I, I learned very shortly that that wasn't the kind of business that I wanted to be in. I was very much gravitating towards the SaaS industry and, and technology in general, something more technology oriented that I could sink my teeth into for a number of years, um, which really ultimately led me to Opal. Yes, so speaking of Opal, what is Opal? What does it do? Well, um, if you think about large organizations, they are spending so much energy with humans and agencies and whatnot, um, putting together campaigns and content. And the way that they stay organized across all of that, um, like the planning side, all the way to you know, the strategic planning side of the execution side is really like done in like spreadsheets, like for the, for all the veneer you see on the outside of a brand, any pick any brand in the world on the inside. Um, and it, it's kind of chaotic, right? Cause it's really hard to keep a lot of people aligned. And so I just had this vision early on with some of the brands that I work with and in, in my own agency capacity of like, what if there was a system that helped everybody stay aligned around plans, calendars, uh, content, um, and you know, wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be a, a smoother process on the inside? And, and that's like, that's been the mission of the organization. Um, you know, w- to this day, we're still, still working that same problem because it's a really tough one. Yeah. And so how does, so who's like the, the typical client of Opal? Um, so I, I like to think about it as, uh, who could like our, our typical clients are, are usually large integration, uh, large organizations. So like Target, Starbucks, those, those size organizations. Um, I like to say though, that like, if you have, uh, you know, if you can fit it, your, your team in a room or the famous, uh, Amazon example, like if you share two pizzas, right. Um, in a room, that's probably not the right size. Like once you get beyond that, once, once you start having more coordination issues and planning issues, um, I think something like Opal starts to make a ton of sense. And so we found that our sweet spot really is, um, you know, getting north of 30, 40 marketers on our t- on a team and having to coordinate and share plans with partners, with share, share plans up, share plans with adjacent uh, teams within the organization. Just being able to have a central place to do planning starts to create a ton of uh, just organizational and cultural unlock. Yeah, kind of t- take me to that process of starting Opal. Like how... You know, obviously you guys identified a need, right? That you needed to fill. There's a, there's a, a void there. How did you guys go about starting to create this brand and building it up and, and bringing on clients to, to the point where you were able to acquire a client like Starbucks and Target? Yeah, I mean, that's such a, a fun part of an organization. Um, to be honest, we didn't actually start with a great insight of, um, of you know, oh, I woke up at 3 a.m. or whatever and I realized there's this burning problem. Um, our journey was a little bit different and yeah, I'd say that's sort of been true of Opal always like we're a little bit unorthodox, but it was really, we, we had a group of people at my agency and other agencies we were kind of adjacent to where we said like, what if we, what if we just started working on a product, a software product, like we're getting out of this agency business where, um, you know, it's kind of feast or famine and, and we, we wanted something that, to create more steadiness in, in what we were doing. And so we just started working on a couple of different pro- products, um, hence the name Labs, right? We were very much in a, hey, let's start this thing, let's tinker, um, let's let's try stuff. So we had a, a product that was more like, if you took Slack and you said it was a, more of like a message board rather than instant me- ch- uh, chatting, um, we had that product like before Slack came out um, and turns out Slack figured it out really, really well. <laughs> that would have been a nice business to ride. Uh, the rocket ship on. Um, we did another product that was called Brainstorms. It was just way ahead of its time, but during the pandemic, it probably would have been really useful because people were all digital and all remote. Um, and once I, I sort of, you know, you kind of align and you learn lessons through those those different products. You know, the first one, uh, you know, I think we were we we weren't quite solid, but both those first few products, we were more of a, of a um, vitamin than a pain pill. And you know, at the same time, I'm trying to keep and and you know, keep in mind, I'm trying to start a product company, a SaaS company out of an agency. And that's like, that's a death wish for anybody that starts that path. Like most people don't survive it or they pull out. Um, and so, you know, at the time I was, I was doing different consulting gigs with um, teams that were trying to scale social and, and just scale content within their organizations. And I would take like, like I'm, I'm really, really good at um, visual, des- <laughs> visual design in keynote. Um, and that, that's like, that was a skill set that I had. And so just be able to like take people's marketing plans and content and put them in something that they could like show their boss or show their boss's boss or whatever. 
I just sort of said, like, what if, what if I made that automated? Like, would that be valuable to the world, right? And sure enough, we put a prototype together. And because we had these relationships with bigger companies, we were able to go and kind of shop this prototype and saying, hey, this is kind of the direction this other thing we're doing called Opal is going. And the response that we got to that prototype just resonated incredibly. And, and we were able to, you know, get our first five customers, get them up and running on the product, have them have success, be willing to, to be a reference for other customers, you know, and like once that moment happens, you know, funding is easier, uh, you know, getting to the next customer is easier. You just start to get this momentum in, in market. Um, and it's an incredible time finding product market fit. You, you know, one of the things you mentioned is you were working in an agency trying to create a SaaS company. Uh, for the yeah. listeners at home, one, what is SaaS and what does it mean to be a SaaS company? Yeah, SaaS is uh, that, it's an acronym. It stands for software as a service. Um, and most of us are using SaaS products today. So Zoom is a SaaS product. Slack is a SaaS product. Um, most of the big kind of like stalwart um, technology companies have turned all their products into SaaS products because there's just it's subscription revenue versus sort of like buying box software. And it was just a major shift in the industry, you know, circa 10 years ago. Um, and so we were like, well, wouldn't that be great to get subscription revenue that you could guarantee month over month over month over month? And then you build a, a business that's right size for that, for the amount of revenue that you have. Um, so that, that's, that's what, that's the, I think, kind of short version of that. Um, there's, there's lots more to SaaS, but that's the simple version. No, that's perfect. Now, now what would you say, you know, starting Opal, what has been one of the more, more difficult aspects of, of growing this company? Well, I got ten. I had ten years of, uh, of of working on this company, so there's there's a lot of um, so many lessons in it. Uh, I think the difficult aspects are, you know, I think I think that there's kind of a couple different phases. Like the first phase of it was here I was this started like founding CEO at the company, um, and you know, I don't care who you are. I mean, I, th I think this is generally true. True, maybe some people feel this way, but like you really don't know anything. Um, you know, you're, you, you only know that you got a pretty good gut and, you know, I think you're trying to do your best. You're seeking out advice, that kind of thing. And I think that your growth at that stage is like really taxing because you're, you, you know, you're kind of faking it right to a certain degree. Like you, if you really know yourself, you know, that you're like, I'm just making this thing up and I'm trying to hustle my way. So like, those are the things that kind of get you to a certain level. And then there's this next level where, you know, you truly have to professionalize. And I think that you you struggle in that um, because you you don't really know what that even means. I, if you're if you're honest with yourself, right? Because like the, the the things you need to be a scrappy entrepreneur are very different than things you need to professionalize a company. And so it's like you kind of have to almost like um, do nothing and give people responsibility and see what happens. You know, which is like so like if you're just someone that goes and seizes the moment. Trying to do that, I think, is is really really hard. And then figuring out like what kind of leader you need to be at these different stages. And so that part's been been a challenge. Um, and then just who you surround yourself with. I think values really really matter a lot. Um, and you know, we that was something that we didn't always get right. Um, and so the the landscape changes. And there were there were way too many founders of Opal in the beginning. Um, for better or for worse, again, we were very unorthodox. But um, you end up kind of seeing who's in it for the long haul or sees the same vision or whatever. And I think you just, uh, you adjust accordingly. Um, and I think that, you know, eventually you you get kind of down to an essence. So there's three of us now at the founding table, um, which are, you know, still operate day-to-day -day operational at the company. Um, and, you know, one is the head of product and the other one is the head of uh, corporate development and, and is president of the company operations. Um, and so to have those two where we're like, we've been through this journey together our bond is forever um, and our values are very, very intrinsically tied together um, and the outcome is tied together. And so I think having, if I didn't have partners along the way, I think it would be really hard. I look at people that are doing this solo and I'm like, that looks harder. Um, you know, there, there's many, there's, there's so many hard things. I mean, Gabriel, I could go, I could go any angle on that question. <laughs> yeah. And it kind of sounds like you, you had a transition at some point where you mentioned you had quite a bit of founders. Now you're down to three. Talk yeah. us through that period and what, what, what kind of made the decision to kind of come down to three? Well, I mean, you, you don't really lose founders, uh, so to speak. I mean, if you're part of founding the company, you're part of, part of founding the company forever. But I think that the kind of moving on day-to-day -day operational role, I mean, that's, 
no one starts a company and thinks that we're like, oh, well, I'm going to be the one that peels off, right? But that's kind of inevitably what happens. It's just not for everybody anymore, right? Or some people just really shouldn't be at the organization anymore. And you've got to make a, you got to have like those kinds of tough conversations that are so hard to have at a founder capacity more so than a, you know, employee, uh, employer capacity. And so that's been the, um, you know, it's, it's, it was really like, do they fit anymore? Or are they slowing us down? Um, Cause some people, you know, like if you're a founder, you do have a voice at the table and some voices will slow you down or keep you going from a direction you need to go in. I recently became CEO again, after about a four and a half year hiatus uh, in 2021, do largely to these kinds of things. Like we needed to move in a direction and we needed to move like with kind of a, a renewed vigor in that. And me being the founding CEO, you kind of need that, uh, I guess, more entrepreneurial spirit in a CEO, that that innovator back at the helm to get the company to where it needs to be. Um, so that, that's been the, um, that's been the role I've, I've played in the last couple of years. You know, you bring up a great point, you know, innovation and, and, you know, putting your product out there and moving forward. How does Opal brand and market themselves? How do you get clients like, you know, the Target and Starbucks of the world? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, there's, there's so many, um, there's so many different opinions on like what works. Um, I think that ultimately it's going to be what works for your business. And so I think you can kind of listen to a lot of different people talk about, um, how they did it. And I think you can learn a lot of different pieces of, of information. For us, you know, we tried the whole, um, like we originally had done like a lot of word of mouth um, and a lot of events. So we go to different cities and an event strategy worked really, really well for us. We didn't do much of a digital marketing, despite the fact like people use our platform from that. We didn't do much of a digital marketing push. Um, over the last few years, we've done more of a digital marketing push, a lot of paid media, that kind of stuff. And, you know, I don't, I'm not convinced that that stuff works better than like the old tried and true playbook. It just, and especially post pandemic where people have this longing and this desire to connect and Opal really puts on a good show. We do a great events. And so what we do, like our number one thing is we go city to city and we bring together our customers and our prospects and say, Hey, let our customers do our selling for us. And I think that we all could attest to the fact that if your friend who you admire and respect tells you something is great you're way more likely to believe that than if you see something on a paid advertiser that talks about how awesome and great it is, you know? And, and I think it's, you know, you cut to the chase a lot faster if, if you can have your customers speak for you. So, and it kind of lines up everybody's incentives. Like for us, the incentive is to provide a great product and deliver a great service to our customers. That's our wheelhouse. That's what we're going to do as best as we can possibly do it. And, and I think that the results are starting to speak in, in that sense. Um, people really are, we're doing a lot more events and people are just like fired up about our direction. Um, this, this sort of revitalized product experience that we've put out. Um, yeah. So I, we're, we like that strategy. It's just make something great and, and then people will talk about it. Yeah. You know, one of the things you've, you've kind of consistently mentioned is the pandemic, right? During that time, you, you mentioned you had a four year hiatus uh, that came back in uh, CEO in uh, 2021. How did Opal continue to operate during that pandemic time? And how did you continue to be successful? Well, uh, I, I don't think we were successful in that pandemic time. I think we really struggled um, for a few different reasons, right? Um, not just, you know, if our, if, our, if our bread and butter was hosted events, you can't do that anymore for two years, basically. I think that that's, you know, and then you go, okay, well, what's our other market? Like, well, we have nothing because we don't, we haven't invested in that. Um, we're, we're different than that now. I think we're now, we have a really great content marketing strategy, um, that I'm, I'm a big fan of more organic though, not, not paid. Um, but you know, that's, that's that side of it. I think the other side of it that, that is, um, that was hard for a lot of companies, including ours was going remote. Um, and I think that that's where, like, I think there was probably already some cracks starting to show in terms of, you know, we were just feeling a little bit stagnant as an organization. And I think the pandemic really accelerated that for us. And so we struggled through the pandemic. And that's part of the reason that I'm CEO now is because it's like, okay, well, if we've got to be a remote organization and we've got to revitalize the product and we've got to like, you know, excite our customers, um, bring, bring back sort of like the entrepreneur innovator personality type um, who just sort of juices the whole org uh, in that direction. And which is like a weird thing to say about yourself, but like, I think I undervalued that the first time around. It was like, that was just me being me. And now I go, well, that's actually a necessary component to like us um, as an organization being successful. Did you ever have a moment of during, during the pandemic or even throughout Opal's growth of self-doubt? Oh my God. Well, I mean, it, I kind of said it earlier, right? Like 
you know, the reason I didn't, it wasn't like we were not performing and then I got kicked out of the CEO role or something like that, or I got voted out or it was, it was significantly less dramatic. It was like one conversation with another co-founder where he, he said, you know, I think it's time that it, it was along the lines of those professionalizations. Like, I think it's time I'm the CEO. And I was like, okay, like, sure. right. Because I, I've been carrying this, uh, this, this like feeling that I'd been making it up. Right. And that like, I really didn't know the next steps. And uh, you know, I, I just, and I thought that like other people must know because they're either, you know, older with more experience or, or whatever, whatever, whatever. Um, and I think that something gets lost when you have the founding CEO moved out. And so like, I think that I, I both like experienced that self doubt in that run up when I stepped down. Um, but then like coming back into the shoes in the role and it was, had a, having observed someone else do it for a bit and, and saw like what worked and what didn't it really, it kind of, I got excited about it, right? Like at first there was that moment where like, you know, oh my God, I'm going to be the CEO of Opal again, right? And this company that was like high flying when I left was like all of a sudden like struggling, um, that, you know, post like tw- during the pandemic. And so there was definitely a moment of like, can I do this? Can I not do this? But like, I, I, I you know, time and experience does matter, um, but it matters in ways that you can't, it's not like time and experience gave me answers to all the questions I didn't have. Time and experience gave me, the ability to know like the 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 knowledge that i will be okay no matter what is thrown at me i will be able to work through it i will be able to figure it out and i have the tools and, and capabilities and people around me that we can figure it out and i think there's a deep piece in that and so that that's really where i try to rest my own mental state as i'm building business is like you know there's going to be highs and lows every single day and like don't get too excited and don't get too afraid um, and if I can kind of stay in that sweet spot, slightly excited, uh, I, I think it ends up well. Like I think the company, you know, you go to work every day and work and that's why they call it work. Um, and, that, and that's what we do, right? Work the problems. You know, one of the things you mentioned is you, you kind of felt as a CEO, you, you didn't know where you were going, right? You're, where, where did you go though for advice? Did you go to did you seek out other CEOs? How did you kind of get over this sense of uh, feeling like you didn't know something? I had, I had, I mean, like I said, we had a lot of founders. So I think that, you know, there's a blessing and a curse in that, right? You have a lot of people that are intrinsically motivated and, and going, willing to go the extra mile to build the company and do the things that are necessary to make it successful. So, but, but the, the downside is that I think we were really insular. I don't think I did a good job at that the first go around. I think I, I sort of, um, uh, you know, I kept, I kept to myself or within that little kind of group of people. And, and because, you know, I, I, I I like to say, like, be wary of like believing your own hype. I think what happens is like you get success and you're in this little group that's been successful. So why would you go outside and and look to others to like get to that next level, which is very arrogant. Uh, I recognize that. Um, But I think that that's kind of what happened to us. Um, And so to, so this time around, you know, there's a couple different CEOs I talked to. Um, I've got great board members that I'm, I'm close with. We just brought on another uh, board member who's more of like a, is a current CEO Uh, just to have that, uh, is a sounding board of like, you know, even, even simple things, right? Like how should, how should I run a board meeting? You know, I think for, for people that are building companies and they get a board, you're like, I don't, you know, like I made this up to get to here and I have board meetings and I've raised money and I'm like, you know, it kind of makes people's heads explode. No one says that, right? Everyone's like, Oh God, you know, everyone's kind of fronting. But the truth is, is like having, having operators who have kind of run a hundred board meetings to call on to say like, is this normal? Is this not normal? Here's what I was thinking. Um, yeah, you'd be foolish not to seek that out, I think. And, and, and it's, and it's really true for anybody in, in any size company that they're starting. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And in fact, you know, folks listening, uh, I, I don't think there's ever a point in your professional career that you're not constantly learning. you right. And you mentioned the board meetings I and mean, I'm just, just kind of creating a board meeting or a nonprofit and going through the legal paperwork of creating a 501 C3, um, having a quorum and, you know, and to your point, you know, George, trying to identify individuals that truly are there to support it. So, for example, find somebody that's professional in operations, find somebody that's professional in product development, find somebody professional in business development, because those are areas I'm probably not the most expert in, right? Find mm-hmm. people, but those are the folks that are going to be able to help me build this nonprofit into something that we really want to be and something sustainable, right? Me and my two other co founders, as you mentioned, trying to identify, um, just tr- trying to identify people in this in this profession in this space that have a little bit more uh, to offer, just so we can kind of continuously grow. Now, George, where where do you see Opal, you know, growing in the next five or ten years? Um, yeah, I always make this statement like no small dreams, right? And I think that 
when you're in a fear state, you, your dreams get smaller, your world gets smaller, everything feels like so, even time span gets smaller. Um, and so taking over Opal, I knew that I was going to be in a turnaround. And I am someone that is dogged when I want something, right? Like I just go for it and go for it and go for it. Like I'm relentless. And if I kind of like laid out the 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 valleys and hills that we've been through over the last two years, I mean, it, it's sort of like most people just kind of look at you like, you know, they kind of start like leaning away because you're like, <laughs> that's stressing me out, you know? Um, so uh, the thing is, is, but, but what, why do you do those things? Like, right. Why would I even go through this? Right. I've got an extreme attachment to this company. Um, I was the founding CEO. The thing that we're pursuing was my initial idea. Um, I have, I, I care about its success deeply. Um, and so I, I've gone through it though, because I, I, you know, I didn't think that, uh, I, I never like going into it thinking like, oh, I just wanted the experience of turning around a company. Okay, I've done that and it's hard. And if anyone wants to like talk about turning around a company, I can tell you what we did um, and you can maybe take some pointers from it. But I've done that now. And, and that's, I, I think turning around a company is as hard as starting a company. The thing that I really get excited about is that our product and our, our what we, like why we exist in the world, what we exist to solve has not been solved in a, in a way that, that we think is sufficient. Um, and it's been, People are still using spreadsheets and they're still using PowerPoints. They're still using all this stuff to just organize and align marketing teams. And so there's this, this opportunity is still there. And, and it's such an important piece of the marketing technology stack that I think it could be huge. And I still feel that way. And, and when I first started it, I thought it could be huge. I just thought that we, at one, at some point we'd kind of lost the plot a little bit. And in, in doing all this work over the last two years, we've gotten to this place where we really know ourselves again. And, I, it, it could be huge. And I want that experience now of scaling a company to significantly bigger size um, and, and building a, a, a household name company. That's, that's why I'm doing this. Um, and again, uh, to my, my point I made earlier, like that's I'm, what I'm relentless in, right? Um, we've been thrown a lot as a company over the last five years. Uh, but to, to be in this state we're in now where our product is hot again, our customers are excited about what our do, what, what, we are doing and our, our prospects, the people we sell software to um, are, are like, wow, I've never seen anything like this, you know, 10 years later after some of our initial innovation, it's cool. And I, I just, I think that we're kind of at that, 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 that cusp, right. Um, of, of being on the map again. Um, so I'm really excited to ride that wave. And I, again, I think Hope Opal can be a household name within, you know, our customer space. You know, one of the things you mentioned, you, you're, you seem to be very, um, ecstatic and you have a big drive where does this passion you you mentioned you know this is your idea your original idea where does this passion for the idea come from you know that's a that's a great question um honestly my this is this is the absolute truth and it's going to sound kind of corny but i saw my friends getting killed from this problem and i don't mean literally killed i just mean that like they were they were trying to do their jobs as marketers, like some of the most creative, thoughtful, smart people in the world. And they're like stuck in these, in these like tools that just suck all the creativity out of you. And inside of organizations that have so many people that are like wanting to know what's going on, that it's just like, you spend so much of your time trying to tell everyone what's going on. And so a little of your time doing the work that actually is marketing. Um, and so, yeah, my friends were really the inspiration for it. And to this day, you know, I've got close friendships with so many of our top customers, um, you know, where, you know, we go out and see them a couple times a year and spend time with them and, and break bread with them. Um, and so just to kind of hear that that's, they're still out there. It's like, it's the spirit of like these people that I, I believe in. Um, I think marketing is a, such a powerful vehicle within organizations um, and to be able to support them in the way that, that we do. Uh, the other part of it though, is uh, I just, once I, like, I, I don't really give up on stuff, if, you know, like I'm, I just, and so I, I feel like the job isn't done. That's another huge part of it, right? The job is done when, you know, we're either on the mountaintop or, or, or we're not right. Buried in the ground, I guess, to be <laughs> extreme. Um, but like, that's it. Right. And, and I, I, that's why I got on this journey and I have no desire to um, do anything else. Uh, this is what I want to be doing. I love it. Now, what advice would you have for aspiring entrepreneurs that are listening? So are we talking about people that, uh, that are, that are, haven't got their business going yet, but they're starting to spend some time on it. Is that the, is that the, 
person. That person or the person that's currently just starting their business right now and they're probably going yeah. through the thick of it. You know, I think I think a lot of people what I've seen a lot of other entrepreneurs go through is where they are kind of going through the motions of starting something, but haven't quite pulled the trigger on it. Um, and I think a lot of people get in this state because either, you know, outside, like it's why, it's why very like a lot younger people have an easier time starting because they don't have as many constraints, right? They don't have to have a, they probably don't have a mortgage. They don't have kids. They don't have a, a you know, spouse, whatever that might be. And so th they have a tendency to be able to like take more, like go all in faster. You know, whereas like if you're trying to balance a full time job and start this thing on the side and you have a family, I think that's really hard. Um, and so it's going to look a little bit different for everybody. I wouldn't be as cavalier as to say, oh, you should just get going and start. But at the same time, like that's what it takes. You kind of have to create your all in moment. Um, and I think that's that's easier said than done. And it looks a little bit different for everybody. Um, but to do it like you got to commit, you know, you got to really commit and whatever that looks like for you, you got to be willing to make the sacrifices necessary. And I think that's, that's the part that's hard. And then once you get started, it really is a matter of sticking to it. You know, I think you're going to get a lot of things that tell you that you're out of your mind. Um, and you got to just keep pushing through that. Um, and eventually if you're willing to, if you're willing to keep going and pushing through hard things and you're willing to sacrifice, then you will find success at some point. It may not look how you envisioned it. You know, a lot of people you hear about pivots, uh, in, at least in the tech space of like, oh, well, you know, Slack famously started as a gaming company and then they became like the collaboration software for the masses. Like no one saw that coming, but it was because they wanted to stick together and they wanted to keep working the problems and they just were willing to try different stuff. So um, I think having an idea where you want to go, but not being so um, uh, rigid in your thinking that you miss the opportunity that may be in front of you. Um, so a couple of different things there, but uh, that that'd be my advice. That that's that's phenomenal because I think you know you're you're truly identifying the diversity of entrepreneurship, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there are those you know solo entrepreneurs that are able to dive in and straightforward. There are individuals like myself that work full time that are slowly building something. And and as you're speaking, George, I, is very resonating with me. And I'm sitting here, yeah, I'm going nice and slow, building up and doing this podcast for about a year and a half. And then I mm -hmm. look down at my desk and I'm like, well, shit, oh dear. I'm, at least I'm doing something because I forgot there's a nice little check right here from, from right. this podcast, you know, so it's, yeah. it is starting to build, right. It's starting to yeah. build and, and, and you, it, it's true. I think, I think at some point you gotta, you gotta do kind of gotta do it right. Kind of get out there and, and network, but you also have to be willing to make the sacrifice and get out there and network, meet with the people, meet with the community, um, really learn, ec try to try to be an expert in your field. I'm trying to get to this point now where, I feel okay now. I know how to edit. I know how to do all these things. Now it's time to outsource it, right? Now yep. that I feel confident yep. in doing it, now I yep. I know I suck at it. <laughs> Let's have someone else do it. <laughs> Let's yeah, have totally. So yeah. so eventually we'll, we'll get there. Now for the folks at home, how can they learn more about Opal if they want to find you on the internet? If they have social media website, how can they find your information? Uh, great question. So um, from a uh, from a, just like, I want to go from this to like learning more about Opal. Uh, we have a URL for you. So it's opal.show slash shades. Uh, that's opal.show slash shades. Um, and then otherwise, you know, we're all, we're in all social media, uh, obviously. So it's at work with Opal, I believe on, on Instagram and Opal on Facebook um, and Opal on LinkedIn as well. Um, and then, you know, obviously through our website, welcome to, to look me up as well. It's uh, George Huff and, you know, happy to kind of engage in any of these topics. It's something I'm passionate about and I love helping out other entrepreneurs or trying to get started in whatever they're doing. Perfect. And again, that's opal slash show slash shades. This information will be on the shades of entrepreneurship newsletter, which is a great time to plug the website. Go ahead and visit the shades of e.com to subscribe to the newsletter. You can also visit at the shades of E on Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook, as well as TikTok. You will not find me dancing, but you may find some clips of these conversations. George, thank you again so much for your time. The CEO of Opal. Is there any last words you want to say for the listeners at home? I uh, just, just want to say that uh, perseverance, keep going, keep doing what you're doing. Uh, there's people out there like myself who are always cheering on those who are starting a journey or mid journey or whatever it may be. Uh, and thanks for having me, Gabriel. Appreciate it. I love it. I love it. Yes, folks listening, your biggest fan is someone you probably have never met yet. So keep going because trust me, there are people out there that want to see you succeed like myself and George. 
George, the CEO of Opal, thank you again so much for the time. For those listening at home, please follow me at the Shades of E on the social sites. Thank you and have a great night. Thank you for tuning in to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow the Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.